I've always said the only difference between prison and the military is everyone has a gun in the military. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome back to another episode of the After Action Podcast. We are joined today by the world famous Arizona <laughs> Matt Kinney himself, a king amongst veteran advocates. So I had this core group of friends, my boys, and three out of the four of us wanted to join the military right after 9-11. And a lot of that was inspiration from Pat Tillman. Uh, he gave up a $8 million dollar a contract with the NFL mm -hmm. to turn around and then go enlist. I mean, we had such strong patriotism and, and love for America and, and, and unified, but I bet that that's the most unified our country has been, you know, in the past. It is unfortunate that most of the time when, when countries come together and when ours do, it's, it's because of an adversary. It's because of some external threat. We've forgotten how great it is here compared to other places. Sometimes I even tell my daughters, like, when you get older and you're traveling, if you don't know, if you're in a different country, you look for that flag. Yeah. Like, you go where those are, the end. This episode is sponsored by ReMedical. Hey, veterans. Ever feel like navigating the VA disability claims process is like trying to march in quicksand? I don't know how much you know about quicksand. It's not great to march through. Well, here's some good news. ReMedical, that's Romeo, Echo, Echo, Medical, is here to support you as you march right out of that mess, and you can keep moving forward. Whether it's a first-time claim or an increase in your existing status, ReMedical connects you with independent providers who can document your symptoms with the precision of a sniper. Only Carlos Hathcock is a better sniper than them. They provide the accurate and thorough medical evidence you need to support your VA claim. With a network of experienced physicians, ReMedical has helped over 75,000 veterans. Can you believe that, Blas? 75,000 veterans. That's a big number. That's a big number, but we're going to blow right past it. They'll explain all your options before you even think about paying anything. No more mystery, just clarity and competence. At the After Action Podcast, we're not just fans of ReMedical. We're customers, too. Blas, what's it like working with ReMedical? Listen, Zach, I'm not going to lie. When you presented the option of going to remedical, I was super skeptical, man. I was already done with the VA process. It, they threw me through the ringer, had me waiting for who knows how long. Anywhere from 6 to 12 months is what I experienced. I know there are veterans out there who have probably experienced a lot longer. When you had mentioned remedical, like I said, I was skeptical. I gave them a call, though. Like you said, free consultation. I had nothing left to lose. I picked up the phone, gave them a call told them exactly what I was going through and the troubles that I was experiencing. They said, no problem. Just send us over your medical records. We'll take a look at them. And if we can help you, we'll reach back out. Not even 24 hours later, I got a phone call telling me that my ratings were not sufficient to what the standard actually was and that if I wanted to move forward, they'd be glad to help me. Almost 12 months later, I finally got my rating back from the VA where I couldn't be more happy with the results. If you're out there and you're struggling and you're sick of running through the VA process and you're tired of getting a runaround, go to ReMedical. I promise you they'll help you and they'll guide you through the process with no pressure and get you the rating you deserve. I couldn't think of a better personal endorsement than that right there. I got to watch him go through the process myself, and it has been a life-changing outcome for him and his family. Don't settle for frustration or unfavorable decisions. Check out the link in the description for a free consultation and $200 off ReMedical Services. It's time to get what you deserve. And welcome back to another episode of the After Action Podcast. We are joined today by none other then it, the world famous Arizona and Matt <laughs> Kinney himself, a king amongst veteran advocates who's doing a lot of good work for us. And we are so happy that you are with us today. Oh, thanks for letting me join the show. Really excited. Love yeah. listening and uh, tuning in. And so it's a great honor to be on. Yeah. And there's not enough military podcasts too, right? You're right. <laughs> we need more of them. We need more of Look, them. This one's got a point to it. And I love the message that you send. If you could kindly write down the message and tell me later what, what the message is. So I'm we not, could run with that? So we could, I don't want to say take it, but if we could lightly borrow it and then maybe merchandise it. A, I don't, a mission statement. Yeah, it is weird. <laughs> this is kind of a tangent. I'm just going to go with it. It is, it is weird because people will ask me, uh, like I had this call with this sponsor the other day, a potential sponsor, and they're like, what is your podcast? And I, I this is literally me in the meeting. I'm like, well, I looked around and there weren't enough military veteran <laughs> podcasts and they like froze. And I'm like, guys, I'm just kidding. <laughs> like, well, 
I, I look at like, you've seen, you remember Jeff Foxworthy and he'd always do that bit, like here's your sign. And it's like, it's, 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 there, there's a lot of things, right? That that I think that the veteran community is like, this is a common sense fix. And, and your show, I think, uh, brings a lot of attention to that. Yes, we got a lot of attention over some stuff this past year, <laughs> um, which we have weathered the storm. And I'm glad to be on the other side of the issues. And the long and short of it is, um, I've been doing this work since 2011, working at state and federal levels to help pass different um, uh, bills, advocacy, whatever I could do. I wanted to get in on it early because, I mean, the, the God's honest truth is in 2011 is when I, my first friend, um, I lost my first friend to this. And uh, I was just like, well, I've, I've got to, I've got to figure this out. You know, we, we've got to figure this out. And it's, you know, it's something... And I want to continue to be, I hate to use the like phrases like disruptor or change agent stuff because it feels a little like boastful of me, but I, I just, I really like open source everything. It's one of my favorite things about Elon. Uh, do you know that like all the Tesla schematics are open source? Oh yeah. yeah. I remember when he did that. And he literally gets people to update his software for free to make it better. And it does. It makes the product better. And he does all of his stuff that way. So that's how I kind of think about this space is like, there's so many different solutions and so many great organizations that help, you know, Remedical sponsors this and they help people get the benefits they need. And they're one of them. There's organizations I like, Semper Fi Fund, um, Gary Sinise Foundation, um, Ranger Roads, one I just found out about from my friend uh, Tyler Vargas Andrews. There's so many different groups out there. But like, I always say this, like when you look at their mission statements, none of them sound bad. They all sound great. You're like, oh, I, I want those things. I want that thing. But you, it's hard to like decipher and it does become a job, especially, dude, especially, especially back in 2011. Dude, it was hard <laughs> being a veteran in 2011. I know it sounds kind of lame, but it actually, it was legitimately hard to get a VA home loan. Yeah. They literally pulled out an encyclopedia when I went to the mortgage office to get my, my first home. And they're like, well, yeah, we think we can do it. And then- we just didn't end up doing it. We went with a different way because the interest rate was so lo low. We did an arm, but um, I don't know. I'm, I'm glad to have you on our side. But before we talk about all the amazing things you're doing for us, let's talk about where you began. Yeah, sure. Where the story starts. Yeah. I'm a Tucson native. Uh, grew up with a, a single mom. My dad was in the Air Force, uh, but they got divorced pretty when I was pretty young. And my dad went back home to Massachusetts, and my mom's whole family was from Tucson. So. After doing a couple stops, and, and one really cool one, we were in Iceland when Reagan met Gorbachev. Uh, so we were stationed there. My dad was a bomb loader in the Air Force, and his unit was assigned to respond or protect the president while he was there. Did you meet him? Uh, I mean, I was two years old, um, but there are some pretty cool pictures. My mom met him, and that's, that, that's part of the story of how I ended up here. Is They were the first Republicans in both sides of my family. On the, my mom's and my dad's side were all Democrats, and... But um, and he, he's just like, look at that boy. <laughs> this boy's going to go far. So he's going to go somewhere someday. Yeah. No, but my mom listened to him and was inspired by him. She's like, I'm re-registering as a Republican. Those are my ideals. Um, so anyway, but anyway, we were back in Tucson. Tucson is a progressively run city. And, you know, as a kid growing up with a single mom who was in a lot of ways raising myself to, I needed to make some money. I wanted to get out of there as soon mm -hmm. as I could. Uh, and so I took off. I went to ASU for, for undergrad. Now, remember during that time, so I graduated high school in 2003, uh, watched 9-11 in a classroom. And, you were in high school then, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it was hugely impactful on me. Mm -hmm. And sorry to go back a little bit. But no, no, that, please. That, I think that that's kind of an important part of that story. So I had this core group of friends, my boys, like I'm sure you guys do too, and three out of the four of us wanted to join the military right after 9-11, right? We wanted to go serve our country. Let's be honest, though, I don't know if anyone really remembers uh, how fired up the country was, right? Toby Keith songs, right? Like, uh, we're going to go kick their ass, right? And so I was really motivated and wanted, like, to go uh, serve in the infantry and, and be on the front lines too. And a lot of that was inspiration from Pat Tillman, Pat Tillman, played football at ASU, right? He was an Arizona Cardinal. Uh, he gave up a $8 million uh, contract with the NFL mm -hmm. to turn around and then go enlist <laughs> in the in the Legitimately, Army like if you look at it, you're like, what? Yeah, so like, I was like, you know. It just shows his like, le his burning desire to want to serve his country. And like, it's, I don't know, he's, 
like the perfect ideal of, of a patriot in my mind, of Me someone too. who really loves this country. And to see the scholarship and the way it carries on after, it's it's literally one of the most beautiful things I can think of. Yeah, me too. And it was like he really defined uh, what service was for me. And so I was already on the officer track. I'd already started school and I was in ROTC. And 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 on, on the other side too, I just want to highlight that, you know, military service provided me, and I didn't look at it like this at the time, but a lot of like socioeconomic mobility, right? Like my ROTC paid for my undergrad and then I'll tell the rest of that story, but mm -hmm. the GI Bill ended up paying for law school. And so I did a bunch of things that I would have never been able to do had I not served. And, and I just want to highlight that for maybe some future service members or people thinking about it that are listening. Have you seen the Jordan Peterson clip about that? Tell me about it. Remind me. He's giving a, a speech and I'm, I'm sure we'll be able to find it, but uh, he basically, I don't, I don't know it's, if it's like one of his lectures or when he's like doing what he's doing now, uh, just like in a larger form, but he talks about um, it is the number one thing that is like almost 100% guaranteed to change the socioeconomic status yeah. of a person by joining the military. Well, I think part of that is your education in the military too, especially when you strip away everything except the uniform and you are who you are. And mm -hmm. so regardless of where you came from, you're competing. And if you're winning, right? Like, I mean, that's the test. Mm -hmm. So uh, really quick, I, I just want to see, have you seen that, the the new, the statue of Pat Tillman out in front of the Cardinal Stadium? It's it's like one of the best statues I've ever seen. And I love that photo of him running with one. his hair. Yeah, that's the it's, one. That's it's the, the one. most like. That's the one at ASU, I think. There's one at the Cardinal Stadium where he's got the helmet off. Anyway, if you find it, I'd love your viewers to see it because it's, oh, there it is. It's perfect. It is. It's such a great um, uh, memorial to him. Charging on both the battlefield and the football field. I mean. That's strong. Yeah. They did. They, yeah, they, they, did. they, they really. A lot of statues that don't come out well, but they did this one. I mean, it looks like he's roaring. Yeah. Like a lion. Like, yeah, yeah. I and like, about that, I, I like even it. like this photo here with like the shadow and stuff. Yeah. Right? Because it's, it just. I remember hearing this, like, when you talk about, like, the fervent patriotism that was alive then, I remember the, the like, Toby Keith for sure. Yeah. I have a Toby Keith story of, in Afghanistan. But um, I remember Freedom Fries. I remember all of that. I remember <laughs> all of that stuff. Do you remember Do you remember that? Like, it was, I, I remember, like, going to, like, McDonald's or something, being like, I'll have some Freedom Fries. And then being like, yeah, you'll have Freedom Fries, not French Fries. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, that's right. <laughs> it was like, we weren't eating French Fries, we're eating Freedom Fries. Because they, at that time, had decided not to support America in the global war. I think they eventually did. I'm, I'm not sure. Again, I was like 12. Yeah. <laughs> so like, um, I just remember that memory being like, freedom fries, please. Or whatever, whatever, whatever age Man, it was. It had taken over the nation. I mean, we had such strong patriotism and, and love for America and, and, and unified. I wonder, you know, I haven't seen any data on this, but I bet that that's the most unified our country has been, you know, in the past. It, it has 25 to be. 25 years. It has to be, right? Like, what was, I'm trying to, were flyovers even a thing then at like sporting events? There's always been the Pledge of Allegiance. I don't remember them being as present. Well, again, I'm, you know, you're younger and you don't, maybe true. don't notice it as much, but I do remember Pledge of Allegiance, not to put, uh, what is it? Not to, the not, national anthem. The national anthem and like all of that stuff. I, I do remember that. And there was always like someone who sang it at the Super Bowl. That was a real big deal. You know, it was a channel dedicated to playing like, um, like every morning. I think they played like the national anthem, or gosh, I can't remember. But you just you would switch to a specific channel in the morning, yeah. and they'd be raising the flag on TV. Yeah, but I mean, I just like you saw every every creed and color carrying around the American flag, and anyway, I I hope that that we could get back to that that point someday. I wish that. How we do you think we get there though? I, I mean. I, I have thoughts on it, um, and uh, my, the main thought I have is that as complicated, beautiful, hard, whatever you want to use for the words that describe America, it's all those things at once, but it is the number one thing when you see that flag, like wherever you are in the world, you know that they will take care of you. Like yeah. it's something I even tell my daughters, like when you get older and you're traveling, if you don't know, if you're in a different country, you look for that flag. Yeah. Like you go where those are, the end. And um I think that we have 
I don't, I don't, I don't know. Like we've forgotten like how great it is here compared to other places. And like an example I can think of right now off the top of my head is Christian Craighead. For instance, the uh, British uh, Special Forces officer, um, or commando, actually. <laughs> He's a commando. <laughs> um, He's not commissioned officer who stopped the terrorist attack and he wanted to tell his story and the UK said no and they fined him and oh, all this yeah. other stuff because they're free, but they don't yeah. have free speech like we have. Yeah. And, he, and it's, like, like, it's a good reminder even in the UK, right? They don't have a they don't have a constitution mm-hmm. based on inalienable rights. He was in a firefight for 20 some odd hours and he was just like, I'll tell this story. And they're like, no. He's the real life James Bond. Like, I mean, it's literally, <laughs> yeah, know. you know, he's like kind, he's he's handsome, he's British, he's got all the things working for him. Yeah. You know, like he'd been in the military for I don't even know how many years he did altogether, but like people forget that, like how great we have it in a lot of ways and like, we're not perfect. No one is, but like the one thing I've noticed throughout my travels local, you know, in and outside of the U S is no one works as hard as we do at being the best. Yeah. And at least in my opinion. No, I think so too. I think our founding fathers did a really good job. And I think at the, the core of what our country is all about is, is competition. Right. And, and uh, that, and we get a lot of, I think, innovation and progress and, we, you know, with a good example is, you know, we've lifted more people out of poverty just in the last few decades than the rest of the world has it been able to in the past, right? Like, yeah. like how quickly we're changing the world. Um, you know, what, what could unify Americans again? I'd like to see us uh, take on some big challenges, some big national challenges too. And those don't have to be, you know, uh, foreign policy related. Do you remember back in the day when we'd build great things, right? Like, uh, you know, building some high-speed freight rail from Canada down to Mexico all the way through the United States. Like some things like that, I think, are, are really inspiring. It is unfortunate that most of the time when when countries come together and when ours do, it's it's because of an adversary. It's because of some external threat that drives mm-hmm. us to, to unify. But I think that there are other things like uh, big uh, national policies that could change you, you saw, I think, a lot of, of positivity in, throughout history when we did big things for our people, when we did big things as a country. And you don't really see that. You're not, we're not building anything. You know, there, there are things going on, I think, to, to better trade in the world. And those, anyway, those are the things that I kind of want to say. I mean, They're not sexy, we right? Did, do, you think, do you think we were on the, ver- like, I feel like we kind of flirted, flirted with it when they tried to assassinate President Trump. Oh yeah, there yeah, was that, there yeah, was, was a true. slight pause, yeah. so we did flirt with it. I yeah, mean, you there, saw there even even on the left, like they yeah. acknowledged how tragic it was, and I mean, forty eight hours later, we were back to and that's back to where maybe we it's were. those reminders, right? Yeah. And we need more of those reminders. I also and and I don't want to get us down a rabbit hole because we could spend the whole show talking about uh, the media. I'm down, but like. But the media doesn't highlight these great things that people are doing, or um, or 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 paint things in a in a picture that is favorable or, or is trying to lift it. Every, everything is negative, right? Yeah. And one, that's one of the things that frustrates me so much. I'll hear about these things that go on in Tucson. Um, you'll hear about you know people being able to compete in the Olympic trials, for example, right? People mm-hmm. from Tucson look in the Tucson newspaper and it's nowhere. And I wonder like, why is that? Why aren't we like cheerleading on the way that I think news organizations really had a pulse on their local communities? Right. I'll tell you why. It's because they're mostly, you know, bought up by by much larger companies, right? And so none of your local publications are really local publications anymore. They're just a brand that's tied to your national your national media organization. I guess that, that, I guess that is true. I mean, because for me, it just... It just feels like a layup, honestly, especially because we're so digital and you're looking at search engine optimization, which is what SEO yeah. means. Like you could just put anything Olympic and it would get clicks because that's really what's driving it. And that would be cool to know that someone in your community is competing in the Olympics. Like yeah, it would just happening right now. I think it'll be done by the end of the week. It, is yeah. it, we're recording it. Today's the eighth, correct? Mm-hmm. Like that's pretty cool. Like when you think about it, like I feel something when I see like, 
you know, the Americans and they came in down the river and stuff and there was like two boats and it was the most amount yeah, of boats. And I was cool. just like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about, <laughs> you know? And Team USA's bodying everybody, you know, especially on the basketball courts. Yeah, like, have you guys seen too? We just, now we have the most amount of medals, most amount of gold medals. We're just crushing uh, this year's Olympics. It yeah. feels great. It does. It feels yeah. great. I mean, because, you see the size of those boats, right? I think we had somewhere upwards of 500 athletes yeah. compared to some of these other countries. Like, that is also a great reminder of, like, the freedoms that we have here, mm -hmm. the resources that we have here. Like, a lot of these countries, man, like, they don't have the resources we have. Oh, they don't have true. the freedoms that we have to be able to train, to be able to wake up every morning. Like, some of these countries are fighting to survive. Some of these people are fighting to survive, mm -hmm. let alone just waking up in your comfortable bed, Walking out, walking into a gym that has everything you could possibly want, cold plunges, saunas, everything you need to be successful. American privilege. Correct. That's right. And I'm proud of it. Look, we worked really hard. Generations worked really hard to get America where we are today. Yeah. And it was uh, bootstrapping for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that we have a lot to be proud of. I think that, that we need to take a, a better look at, at those kind of things too. I think we can do both. And that's what I don't feel that we do. We, we don't have like pride for America. Like people too often I feel have, will say all the things that we're doing wrong, which there's every, everything is, everyone has issues, but yeah, like always. we can do both. We can be proud of the accomplishments we have and then looking for ways to improve it. Always. And I, I feel like we, we go, oh no, no, America's not perfect. Well, I didn't say that. I said, <laughs> I said we're the best. Yeah. <laughs> because we, like, like they're not like trying to like, you know, boost people up in other countries the way we are, change people's socioeconomic status, break generational trauma, do all those things by giving people opportunity and stuff. Because like, ultimately, like you look at like some of the Olympic sports, they're really kind of specific, Yeah, you know, and we're funding it like to allow people to compete at these levels. And like, it's, I don't know, it's just cool to see. Yeah, no, no, I definitely agree. Uh, you guys saw the, the Turkish shooter yeah. yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about? You mean the the world-class assassin? That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. and don't tell me that you guys, the first thought in your mind wasn't like, I'm going to go pick up that sport. My, I, I need to be out there, right? That's my, that, that's my sport right there. It reminded me of Clive Owen. <laughs> He looks like Clive he Owen. Yeah, he he looks like Clive Owen in the first uh, Born Identity when uh, Jason Bourne kills him, <laughs> yeah. and he looks oh, at him. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he looks does, at him totally. as he he's dying. Just like him. As he's dying, he goes, "Do you ever get headaches?" And he's like, "What?" And he's like, "The headaches are just they suck <laughs> because like he realizes as he's dying that no one else other than him will have this yeah, experience." Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, move over, Hawk Tua. <laughs> yeah, dude, I love it. I love it. And it's just the memes of like everyone having like the eye shields and stuff. And he's got his hand in his pocket. He's just like, hey, man, I'm here for this. I know. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> All right. We'll figure it out. That's wait, the only other shooting meme that existed before him is the guy with the crazy elbow. Have you seen that one? The one where he like his elbow bends inside. Not outside, but yeah. it bends in and he's just like this. <laughs> and that he has now been dethroned by, what is his name? Turkish shooter. We gotta, we gotta learn this guy's name. I probably couldn't pronounce it. My life depended on it. Cash, oh, look at it. That, that's a good headline. Let's hear it for them. That's a good headline. I don't need special equipment. I am a natural, a natural shooter. <laughs> and, hey, have you guys seen how far away those targets are? How Let's far see. was it? Does it say? I didn't see it. Um, all I know is like lens crafter, all of them need to be hitting him up immediately. Yeah. Like Warby Park. Somebody needs to send him like a glass, <laughs> like a, pers a prescription glass yes. deal. Did you say his name is VX. Yeah. All right. 51 year old. I, he, he looks like Clive Owen. That's Clive Owen. He really does. He looks just like the, the, the character I'm born. So, yeah, uh, I don't know where we left off. I don't know how we Well, no, it's just it, hole, the Olympics to me are honestly yeah. a reminder of like kind of the world at its best where we can take pause a little bit. I, I don't know if that's really what the original idea was to have some type of unity. I, I hope it was. I, I hope it is. Yeah. I want to believe that it is because it's literally like, hey, we're just, we're just doing a game, man. Let's just, instead of doing wars, uh, real life risk, let's just you know, do um, handball, let's do diving, let's do shooting, let's do gymnastics. Also, Simone Biles, insane. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Literally, I can't literally believe she insane. just comes back. She's like, I'm going to retire. Three years later, she's dominating again. Or was that seven years? 
Anyway. No, she did the to- she did Tokyo. Yeah, right? she did Tokyo. Tokyo. She did Tokyo. Um, and my both my daughters. She took did- the bronze. I think that was the only medal she won that oh, year. Oh, I see. Yeah, because she was like she had the twisties, which is real, and people don't understand that because it's where your your brain gets confused where you you are in the air and things. I just like remember that. how much heat she caught. Oh yeah, yeah, from, I remember that now too. From people who can't touch their toes, like <laughs> being like, "I would do better." Yeah, that's my internet voice. Yeah. No, I think it does. It has a huge positive impact. It's really interesting. Like I was watching the volleyball, and you saw a you know an, an Arab country, and they were like in you know full mm-hmm. uh, full headdress and stuff. And then you had um, it was it was maybe Italy, I think. Anyway, they were they were in their their skimpy bikini, right? And I was like, oh, Complete that's so opposite. interesting, yeah. right? Like yeah. I wonder afterwards when they're like chatting, you know, um, wh- whether or not that there's any impact or influence that they're having on each other. And I think also when you're, you know, you're playing a sport and, and everybody's in it for the same reason to win, um, you know, you kind of shed some of those feelings that you have towards different countries. So I think that it does bring bring some peace in the best possible way too, mm-hmm. right? You're out there, you're just playing a game, you're playing a sport. It's okay to get along. It's okay to get along. It's also okay to have air conditioning. I don't know what Europe's got against air conditioning. I don't. I don't either. I so I, apparently they're uh, anti AC. Look, when I horrible said, idea. <laughs> when I when I grew up with a single mom, like we didn't have air conditioning in Arizona. It's like I didn't have it until I went to college, right? I like For grew real? up without an air conditioning. Now Tucson is a little bit cooler than Phoenix, but it's still hundred degree summers. That's not. We're cool. like every single one of us, me and my brother and my sister, we had a fan that was like four inches from our face mm. on our bed, and it would just blow on it to, to keep us. cool. Keep us cool. But now, right, like now that it's so inexpensive that it's becoming standard in every single home, especially in Arizona, right, it is blowing my mind because I feel so bad for the the young kids who grew up like me and were like miserable. Um, it, it adds to it, right? Like you, it makes doing homework harder. It makes like, you, you know, going out harder. It's like, you know, hot and it's not gross great. and you yeah. know what i mean i just mean like oh i know so now that we have ac i'm like appalled and gas stoves like that blows my mind too what they don't if ga- like natural gas isn't actually kind of saving the country currently right like we we have natural gas fracking all those things are making america more competitive i'm not going to go down that rabbit hole but <laughs> but you know what i mean i just think that like we are finally getting to a place where life is a little bit easier for people. Mm-hmm. And we're like, nah, screw you poor people, right? We're going to make it hard on you all over yep. again. Yeah. I remember when my, when my dad got a car with air conditioning, it was a game changer. Yeah. Like it was, and it was the air conditioning that is for sure punching holes in the, in the <laughs> atmosphere. I can't remember exactly. You can like see the green stuff coming out the side. <laughs> I yeah. remember the, the vents would, the would frost. Yes. You remember that? It's, oh, um, that's a good AC. It's, it's literally illegal now. Uh, I can't. So it's like, what is it? 134A is what everyone has now. It was, I think it was R12. And you had to have like licensing and stuff. Cause like, there that's were, the AC I want that I have to go get yeah. a license for it. It 100%. was gnarly. And I just remember being like, he's like, roll up the window. And I was like, why? Like, cause he always be like, we have 240 air conditioning. And I was like, what's that? And he's like, two windows down, 40 miles an hour. And <laughs> we weren't always doing 40 miles yeah, an yeah, hour. Yeah, yeah. And it still sucked. But when he's like, roll the windows up and he cranked it, I was like, oh man, this is, this is a game changer. The trailer had air conditioning. That was fine. I just remember, thinking that because the vents were on the floor yeah, yeah. and how awesome it was. Literally, I can't imagine being in 2024 in Paris, France, one of the like greatest like tourist attractions ever. And you go to sleep on a cardboard bed and they're like, there's no air conditioning in the Olympic village. I'm just waiting for them to have like a headline about the growing like black market problem with ACs. You know what I mean? You got like <laughs> yeah. whole cartels dedicated to just yeah. slipping you a little cool air. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would not do well, man. Walking out, just walking out of my house and feeling that humidity just kick you right in the face, man. Just instantly pissed off. Like, dude, no, imagine I'm, just like having the mindset to go and compete on a global stage. Yeah, I'll go and do my just best. Be pissed off, dude. We did a group podcast and uh, we're all there and everyone's like, I, I walked outside once and my wife was like, what'd you do? And I was like, ah, I, I picked something up off the ground. <laughs> like, I'm just like literally constantly sweating. So I, I'm not made for it. Yeah. We're on the tail end of it, boys. We are. We are on the tail end of it. But I, I also love the heat. No. Arizona heats a lot though. Well, I know, but you don't have there there's a bunch of other things that you don't have to deal with in mm-hmm. Arizona because of the heat. Really, we don't have to deal with the snow. I, I went back to Massachusetts 
uh, pretty regularly growing up. And I, I don't think that I could handle the winters there. Like they're nice, right? Like when it first snows and you go out there and you like play. Mm-hmm. But when you have to live real life and like there's five feet of snow in your front nope. yard and on the nope. streets, I just, and, and, and it gets to the core to me now. And I don't know if that's just growing up in Arizona um, and, and just being, living in, in mostly uh, warm climate states, but I can't handle it, right? I went back for uh, my grandfather's funeral uh, two years ago. It was it was in the winter, and I mean, I we probably were only standing outside uh, for 15 minutes, right? And I I swear it got to my bones, it got to my core. It was like I was freezing for two hours. I was wearing a whole jacket. I was back in the heat. It was like it was it had gotten to me. No, I I understand. I'm not made for the cold. No, I, it's just not. I, I'm I'm made for the heat, the humidity. <laughs> I mean, the humidity's. I understand it's bad here but it's not as bad as at least for me growing up in memphis because it would come off the mississippi and it was literally like being in like fog constantly yeah like south carolina (sighs) i was there the for a short military training in the summer and that was by far the most miserable place i'd been i guess kuwait's a lot like phoenix though have you ever been to jrtc summer fort polk louisiana because i went to ntc (sighs) what is that what's the difference this is hey guys big army talk go ahead all right so so i'll I'll let you no go you can go so you got the national training center and the idea there was it that's held in california by the way no it's in the it's in the um 29 yeah it's just northwest of 29 palms it's very similar to 29 palms okay it's a giant training facility for the Army, uh, originally built uh, World War II era for artillery, right? Literally the yes. middle of the desert. Uh, it's the worst place to be. Uh, I got sent there. And that was modeled after Iraq, correct? Yeah, sorry, that's where I was going. So that one is modeled after Iraq. They actually had hundreds of former Iraqi like Terps that, that we worked with that were now living out there and, yeah. and just playing themselves out in a village. In a mount town? Like in, in a, yeah, exactly. You'll call mount town. Oh, right? not only that, let me, there, there is some cool stuff about NTC. One, they have this massive global, uh, I mean, it, I can't even, it's like something out of Star Wars or Star Trek, right? Where they're like battle tracking everything. Um, but it's just impressive because it's in this like secret uh, auditorium. That's what I'm looking for. But then they also have, you know, you go out there, you put all the miles gear on, and I'm mm-hmm. not sure if you guys did that in the Marine Corps. No, you had like the we, laser tag system that they have out there. No, because we didn't have Army money. Is the, That's right. Is you, the, the only broom way. sticks is what you guys were. We had BFAs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> we had BFAs. And so, uh, sorry. No, everything was notional. Like, I got you, and then they would, like, we would do the Mount Town scenarios. And, oh, yeah. And at that time, 2000, I because I went oh, yeah. to, yeah. I, I think it's the same as 29 Palms. 29 Palms is... Yeah, I went there, but they would like tag a guy and be like, hey, we were being replaced. And they would grab some wounded veteran who like lost yeah, his course. legs and they would drag him in and be like, this is Matt now. <laughs> <laughs> and like triage him and all that jazz. Well, one of the cool things is they set up all of these, I guess you just call them, they're not, I mean, they're just, they're just wires across the city, right? Mm-hmm. But they're set up so that you could fire these fake RPGs at people too. So those were like kind of cool. And then they had ID. So that I was hit with one of those Mm. when I was in my Bradley too. And, uh, it, you know, it's a, an explosive or a pyrotechnic, I think you wouldn't want to call it an explosive ice, but it's like filled with, um, different colored powders too. And so like, you know, they would be able to mark you if you had gotten hit Mm -hmm. you try to like get away with it too. So Man, can't uh, hide money, huh? Yeah. So, so anyway, so the the NTC was for Iraq and JRTC was for Afghanistan. JRTC was in Louisiana, and mm-hmm. I'll let you pick it up from here because yeah. I have never been there. Yeah, JRTC was uh, in Fort Polk, Louisiana, like every other army base, regardless of the money that we have. The army will find the shittiest yeah. location in every state <laughs> yeah, right. and say, "Hey, that's yeah, a how perfect many mountains place." Are in Louisiana? Yeah, not a lot. <laughs> not a lot. I'm not, not a mapologist, but it's pretty no. flat. There's a fuck ton of swamps. I'll tell you that <laughs> yeah. much. Um, but yeah, no. So yeah, JRTC again, like NTC, you'll do like a 30 day rotation where they have scenario scenario based training again with Miles Gear, the laser tag stuff. It's essentially the same thing as NTC, just the Afghanistan version of it. Um, but man, it is miserable there. It is hot. There's no service. Like, I mean, you would have to, there is like a, there is a place where you could go and get like some pizza and like, you know, some gas station goods and stuff like that. But like, I mean, by the time we were done with training, like those places were closing down, you, you weren't about to wait 
30 to 40 minutes, sometimes two hours yeah. just to get a damn slice of pizza. Like it was miserable, man. Like if you heard you were going to JRTC, like, man, it was brutal. And sometimes you'll do a JRTC rotation and you won't even deploy. What? Yeah. So, okay. So the training cycle ends with a deployment to NTC or RTC. So even if you're not deploying right. your two year, you know, you go through individual training then team and squad, you work all yeah, the way up. It's yeah. all elite. The culminating up. exercise for a battalion every two years is to go back to RTC, JRTC or, or NTC. Yeah. Whoa. So you'll do like, that's your index for the, the training. Yeah, correct. Cycle. Yeah. Where, so you'll do like team live fire, squad live yeah, fires, yeah, yeah. platoon ranges, all yeah, that, all that stuff. All no up to way. That. You know, what's interesting is, and, and I think I mentioned this, is one of my buddies, I said that I had that core group of friends that all serve. Uh, he went into the Marine Corps. He enlisted right away. He's like, yeah. you know, did, did I think a week or two of college? And was like, I'm out. I'm done with this. And um, I feel seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, I, well, he just retired too. And I'm like, I'm like, what are you going to go do? He's like, I'm going to go back to my high school, be a football coach. I'm like, that sounds fun. That's a, that's a good life. That sounds awesome, actually. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, the, we were talking about the lead up to the deployment yeah, in TC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, that's what I was going to say. So so my buddies would always share. And I think that, and this is what you and I were talking about before we, we went live and we we're talking about this training is that I, I wonder, I'd like to see an analysis because the Marine Corps does do that all as a unit, right? Like yes. even when you do what we would consider individual training. So uh, like if we wanted to go to mountain warfare school, right? It's an individual, like they send one dude. They're like, mm. here you go. I mean, except if you're in that like National Guard unit in Vermont or wherever they are. But, um, but like the Marine Corps will take an entire unit so that they're doing this training together. And I think that there's there's a lot of value in the way that the Marine Corps does that type of training too, where it's more focused on, we need this unit to work cohesively really well together. We don't necessarily need, you know, one dude to have a Ram's horn on his uniform again. So no. I think that, you know, yeah, no, there's maybe point. some budgeting. No, I, I, and you know what, I haven't even thought about it that way, but that's it's 100% true. Like the Army's philosophy is that person's going to come back and he's going to train the soldiers in his unit with the skill that he just learned. That almost never happens. Yeah. The train the trainer concept. Yeah. 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 It, it is, I, I think, the original idea behind Ranger School was, mm. I mean, before, you know, World War II completely kind of changed with what that was going to be. Uh, you know, the Rangers were supposed to take those skills, those jungle or mountain warfare skills and, and take yeah. them to their units. I, I, I can't think of a single instance besides when I had opportunities to do fun things with my soldiers to do like a one row bridge or do some some <laughs> like mountaineering type stuff, right? Mm -hmm. There was I wasn't sitting down there being like, let me teach you about the ranger, the ranger way. Yeah, you know, and, and it didn't yeah. happen like that. It doesn't happen in in practice. And so um, you know, I'd like to see us do or I'd like to see the army adopt more unit level uh, training like that. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing for you to take your infantry platoon uh, up to Alaska or wherever it is that you guys do that cool school? Bridgeport. Bridgeport. Bridgeport, California. Oh, I mean, California. that's where. Yeah. That's where. Uh, I mean, that's where. That's where that team building, you know, happens. That's Brother. where the suffering. Yeah. Um, suffering oh, together happens. Yeah. I mean. We. Uh, so. Yes, to everything you've said. There's. We always did it as a group and. It, sometimes schools would be offered as like incentives for like reenlistment mm -hmm. and you have like a one-off where they're just trying to fill like a T and E or something. They're just trying to fill out a table. So yeah. be like, Hey, do you want to go to Sears school or different things like that? We did have some weird, not weird, just like small, like train the trainer things. Like we sent guys to a course called combat hunter and they would come back and teach, you know, it was like look for disturbed stuff and different things like yeah. that. But I mean, we, w I remember uh, when we went out to 29 Palms, Right, literally the week we were doing it, they gave us all, I think it was the week. Yeah, they gave us the smallpox uh, vaccine. Is it smallpox or anthrax that they do twice? Smallpox. smallpox. So like it's I, it's here on my arm, the scar somewhere. Yeah. But they gave us that. And so we went out there with like low grade flu basically. And then like halfway <laughs> through it, they like stick you again. And I remember being very cognizant of it because my wife was pregnant and they're like, is well, this the one that kind of looks like it's infected the whole time too? Yes. It's got like a pimple on it or whatever. Yeah, it was not great. It was not great. Yeah. But um, just, I wonder if I should tell that story. Uh, I did sneak off at 29 Palms. That's hilarious because I was actually going to share a similar story. It, hadn't, it wasn't me, but there was a, an officer and another battalion who took off with a government van to Vegas. Hell Yeah. 
And hey, so, it's almost similar so, to what you did. So by coincidence, I had heard the I had heard the story of what had happened. Yeah. Well, a year later, that guy gets assigned to me when I was an XO as my FSO. <laughs> First of all, he had given up. Right when you get in that much trouble yeah. in, the, in the middle, you know that your career is over. So he was like. He was that guy that drove the first sergeant and the sergeant major crazy Ooh. as an officer. Um, but I'll, I'll have you know that I've been to his house. He got married a couple of years ago, so he hung out. And he has his letter of reprimand framed in his office. And it says, took a government man off to Vegas or like whatever. <laughs> That's frame worthy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think so too. Uh, we need his contact info. I want that story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, my story is not as cool as that. Um, we... 29 Palms, it's Marine Corps stuff, stuff breaks down. The long and short of it was we had a weird gap in the training cycle because we would like, so if you're there Monday, we would plan on Monday, go out Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, hopefully come back, clean gear, and then they would kind of secure us for like that week and then yeah. we would move on to the next thing. Well, uh, the dust trails behind the vehicles are like so big and it was just gnarly. Apparently, they were convoying out to one of these ranges and just, boom, <laughs> like destroyed the convoy. So to these flatbeds, Marines go flying everywhere. It took us down. So like, hey, we basically ended up with like three days in a row of nothing to do. And me and my friends were calculating <laughs> like how far we could get. And we had a Vegas plan, but we weren't sure. We wanted to test the waters, right? Yeah. And we had our emergency civilian attire, which is – um I mean, I, the most military looking in stuff. In your wet weather bag. In the wet weather bag, yeah. <laughs> so we had, you know, a polo, some jeans, some dockers, you know, st you know, stuff that you wear when you show up to the embassy and you yeah, say, yeah. I'm here from Doctors Without Borders, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. And uh, we just had a wild hair and a bunch of us got together. We're like, hey, we're going to go out to this bar. We haven't eaten barely anything. We've been out in the field. We're dehydrated. We call up the taxi cab. We're like, hey, meet us there. He's like, no, negative. Because <laughs> they're all <laughs> <laughs> He's like, meet me here. This is a way better spot to pick you up. Click. And I was like, I don't know. I guess he's done this before. We get there. Of course, he's like an old sergeant major. This is what he does on the weekends. He just chauffeurs Marines around. Oh, that's funny. We hop in the back of the thing. This is where my memory gets fuzzy. Um, <laughs> I don't know how many Long Island iced tea pitchers I bought. I do know that Just I- Just one can sometimes do it. That was enough for me. We were bent over the barrel, just done. And my night wrapped up rather quickly. But the one thing that saved us was mutually assured destruction. Because we're in there in this pool hall, you know, drinking horrible, <laughs> horrible Long Island iced teas. And I look up and I go, I don't want to name him. But I go, look, oh, hey, Gunny. <laughs> he walks in. <into, laughs> he goes, what are you doing here? And I go- what are you doing here? And he goes, this never happened. I go, Roger that. Do you want a drink? And he goes, yeah, I have a drink. <laughs> Jump cut. I remember waking up with my two friends, carrying me back to my rack and I'm in my, I'm in my clothes. I'm in my clothes. And, uh, I just remember being laid down on my bed and they were like kicking stuff over. Cause we got dropped off on the far side of base. Yeah. We walked through other hooches that weren't ours. It was a whole nightmare thing. I wake up in the morning. I'm in green on green, green shirt and silkies. And I look out in the corner of my good buddy, my good buddy's from Georgia. He's smoking a cigarette, and he goes, uh, good to see you're awake, Bill. And I go, yeah, man, that was quite a night. And he goes, yeah, it was quite a night. And I go, what What happened to my clothes? And he goes, well, I came in, and you were in your civvy, so uh, I had to take care of you and had to change you over. And I go, <laughs> and I just like look down. I go, dude, thanks, man. You're such a good friend. And I go, my underwear is different. And he goes, yeah, things got weird. I'm gonna go. <laughs> I'm gonna go to sleep now. <laughs> like, like, literally stripped me. Like, came in drunkenly. Apparently, I didn't move at all. Obviously, I was just like woke up. And then we slept for a day. And we were gonna. We, so we had tested out. We can't escape. We can't go to Vegas. And we were gonna go out again, but the training cycle moved. And I'm yeah. glad you didn't investigate that further. Yeah. On what really <laughs> happened. Yeah. Could have gone bad. You just you uh, chalk up to. My Never. wife was enraged. <laughs> she was like, why, why are you in, out in town? It's wild uh, when you look back and you think about the types of risks that you would take like that. I yeah. mean, you cared about your job. You didn't want to get in trouble. You didn't want to get caught. But yet, like, we, we take those risks all the time. Mm -hmm. For sure. So I was in, um, when I was in ranger school, I was went during a very unique period, and it provided me with an, an extra awful experience while I was there. You went during the winter? 
not only did I go during the winter, I went through the last class of the winter of the season. <laughs> so what happens if you recycle in the last class of winter ranger school? You have to do. You become best rangers bitch for four <laughs> weeks, right? And so they, everybody's a private there, yeah. right? You remember? And uh, so they, I was stuck in Dahlonega and they would bust you down and like you had like, it was just details the whole time. And so it was like being in a holding company between like basic or ART is the only thing that I can compare it to. Okay. But- so listen, like prison rules start to develop really quick when yeah. it's like four weeks. Listen, we weren't allowed to have books. We weren't allowed to have games. We didn't have like cell phones. We still had the pay phones, right? Like that we all had to wait in line and we had to go. You know, they, they, they keep just to torture you at, at basic training and apparently ranger school. <laughs> so uh, when I mean prison rules, like not only that, but there's like a prison economy that develops too. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, and, and like, I mean, this is, like guys who've done deployments and uh, are come over here from from battalion, right? These are, you know, we had a uh, two green berets. We had three Marines with us in our class too. Well, nice. my only point, right, is that when I tell you what we we're using for currency, it's gonna blow your mind. It was gum, right? Like bubblicious <laughs> and like fruit stripe, and like that became the foundational currency. And not, I'm not saying that you even wanted the gum, but you used it because then you trade for like candy bars or things. And then it got even crazier, right? So we would have care packages, but you could only have the care package for an hour or two, right? And so, uh, you know, Ranger students got smart in that, oh, if I just hide it really quick, right, before we have to go throw it all in the dumpster, right, I can then go hide it later in the woods. So then it develops even further. And so guys start following other guys into the woods to steal their stuff <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> while they're in the woods. You guys right? were learning about caches though. Learning about caches. Yeah. And listen, then it was like, there was this other sort of side of it too, where there was a, like a bare knuckle boxing uh, competition that was running every single night. Not only that, and this is where it got to like the pinnacle was then two guys were like, fuck it. And they called their girlfriends and had them pick them up. They land nabbed. And I, I was just impressed because they did it and they got away with it. They land nabbed out to the road, had their girlfriends pick them up. They went out drinking, got dropped back off and were back in their bunks before, before we got checked. And I was like really impressed, you know, that, that they were able to pull off that whole operation while also being a ranger student. Yeah. Now they're senators. And now I'm sure they're senators. <laughs> now, so that's, I, I just, it, it, um, it's crazy how human behavior uh, can, can be kind of predictable in that way. And it really was. I look back and it was like prison rules in, in ranger school. So so then I get the the joy of doing mountains again, but during the summer. And actually it was nice out. But then you go down and in Florida, now it's hot. So I don't even get to like get to enjoy Florida. Uh, it is now muggy and disgusting by the time I got down there. And, and, you know, that's never any fun. That was my least favorite of the three phases was was Florida. Hope you guys are enjoying the episode. If you want to continue to hear more stories like this and to help us grow the podcast, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and to also drop a rating and review. Every bit helps. Thank you so much. Now let's get back to the episode. I've always said the only difference between prison and the military is everyone has a gun in the military. <laughs> because like you're talking about the prison economy. I literally remember being like, how many cigarettes do you have? Like yeah. talking to dudes, especially when you're overseas. Yeah. You know, I've got a, I would, my wife would only, she'd be like, I'd be like, send me tobacco, send me dip and send me cigarettes. And she'd be like, one time she didn't send me hundreds and I had to like walk. <laughs> she'd never bought tobacco a day in her life. Yeah. I don't think she ever has. And no, she hasn't other than for me. And then I, she's like, why do, why do I get 100s? And I was like, babe, that's a, that's a fire team cigarette right there. That'll <laughs> that'll last four guys. <laughs> yeah, it will. A hundred will sustain a fire team a day. And she's like, oh, I never thought of it like that. And like, you're just trading. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. hey, all right, how many Cheez-Its do you have? <laughs> and like, you're just peeling off like Newports. Yeah, yeah. It was a big Newport phase. You mean, yeah, same. The Camel Crushes is what Camel, I Dude, Camel Crushes <laughs> changed the tobacco game yeah, because you had customers everywhere. Yeah. You're like, it was like choose your own destiny, but for nicotine. Yeah, no, I didn't even <laughs> smoke, but I enjoyed smoking the, the Camel yeah. Crushes too. They, I like them. Yeah, I mean, it'll, you're not, you're hungry, you're tired. Hey, Get a crush. You know? Yeah, that's right. It's literally what we were doing. It was the best part, man. I mean, you just socialized with like a cup of coffee, a cigarette, like on the shitty fucking broken down bench, and you just bullshit. Talked about what you were going to do when you got home. I know. And when you true. made it back. So, uh, had, did you guys ever create like lists of like the food that you were going to eat when yes, you got out or yes. like the places you would go? I had that. 
and I had dumb business ideas that I'm semi embarrassed <laughs> of. <laughs> like uh, those just, are probably fun to look back on. Yeah, I I um I read some of my old uh, patrol books, my Right in the Rain books, and yeah. it's out of context, it's insane. In context, it's even worse <laughs> because like it's just like free form thoughts. Because I don't know, I guess I thought I was Hemingway at the time. Uh-huh. Like I was just like today on the Off battlefield. The war. Yeah. Also, I think that's fake. I think everyone talked like us the way we do now. But like, if you read stuff and it's like, dearest Dolores, how I miss, how I long for your touch. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that's real. I think it's like, Dolores, I can't wait to be home because you know you hot as hell. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, no. like so but, but everyone, they read the historical documents like, I long to, I long to gaze upon your beautiful smiles. <laughs> like, babe, you're hot as fuck. I can't wait to see you. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's all nice stuff. But like, it was like crazy random thoughts. And then it would be like, uh, my patrol checkpoints are like my mo me no which is my pack count. And yeah. then it'd be like over here and I'd be like command signal one, command signal two. And then like next page is like, when I get home, I'm going to blah, blah, blah. I'm going to eat sushi. I'm going to go here. I'm going to yeah, go there. Yeah, yeah. See, for me, it was like there were the opportunities where you got to like go to a, like the MWR, right? When they had like internet or whatever. And it didn't matter what time of the night after you're running mission, like you showered real quick, you ran. Hopefully you can get on the internet for like, 30 minutes or so Mm -hmm. or whatever. But man, looking back at some of those Facebook messages, the boy was horny, dude. (laughs) Dude, uh, The kids call it down bad. I was right there with you. (laughs) If if those leak, it's a wrap. I'm glad my Facebook got like hacked and deleted, dude. Do you remember that? Remember when they leaked? Do you remember when like messages leaked, Facebook messages? And it was a bunch of soldiers being like, dude, like I could not imagine. I remember being on, uh, what is it? The one overseas, is it Sipper or Nipper? I can't remember which one. Uh, it was, uh, I want to say Sipper. Sipper. Sipper, yeah. Sipper. Yeah. Well, what was not a secret or they no. didn't, they didn't look into it was that, uh, Facebook messenger worked. And so I'd go in there and like, I, I rotated all my guys through, they all talked to their girls, but I do remember like, I would, <laughs> one of them didn't sign out and I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> one of them didn't sign out and I saw the messages. I was like, brother, you can't leave, you can't leave this in the wild yeah. because it was in the COC and I would go in there and be like, here's my pre patrol report. And I'd give them the report and they would. I'd wait for them to call it up and I'd be like, what's up? And I would look at the Bolo list and it's every color of a Toyota Corolla known to man. <laughs> yeah, Do you think Toyota knows? They know, right? They have to. They have to know. They've got to think that that's like a really like long-term and impressive marketing strategy right there, right? Like, hey, look, low budget, lo- low budget war, right? You know, just, just throw a giant cannon in the back of a Helix and you guys are good to go. <laughs> Someone somewhere has to be like, so we're going to talk about our Middle Eastern division. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, they are uh, crushing it. They are like, everyone leave the room who doesn't want to, they're like, everyone leave the room who doesn't want to be depressed, but we're, we're doing really good. We're doing really good. <laughs> hey, what do we need like the reinforced bed for? Oh, you don't need to worry about that. You yeah. don't need to worry. That so, just comes stock on the ones we send to the Middle East. They're like putting mounts in the truck bed. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> they're like, we're taking over this aftermarket I want to see what they name the package, right? What edition is this? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, God, that's a good question. Maybe like, I shouldn't have started that. Yeah, we'll just get I was like, that's a great way to get canceled. <laughs> that's a really good question. Because, like, the amount of Toyotas that I've put 5.56 and 203s <laughs> through is a lot. They're resilient, though. I do remember very vividly watching, just having this outer body experience as I watched a Toyota Corolla co- traverse a poppy field full of, <laughs> full of Taliban <laughs> being like, no one's going to believe this. But Dude. apparently that's all that happens. They're just like, go. And it was, it did not have off-road, all-terrain <laughs> tires. It was just a four-cylinder Corolla and it was doing just fine. Dude, some you know, of the stuff you did on deployment was so funny, man. Like I just remember my shower shoes. I had like these blue shower shoes. And I just remember screwing around, dude. And I just drew like the Jordan logo on them, and like, fucking <laughs> <laughs> like walking, yeah. in, walking into the shower. Everybody's like, "What are those?" People, your <laughs> other naked friends are looking at you, your naked shoes, being like, "Dude, what's up? That's yeah. pretty cool, boss." <laughs> bro, he just did the, the dumbest Jordan, stuff, bro. Uh, no, we used to do. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is when we first got the robot. Right? Did you guys get a robot? Right? So, like, instead of calling EOD, they're like, hey, infantry dudes, we'll just give you your own robot. Do we give you explosives? No. I mean, what are we going to do? Like, go pick up the ID and just bring it into our vehicle? Like, anyway, so they gave this robot, and I'm like, well, we don't really have, like, anything to do. I, just think about that, right? Did like, they train what do you, you do with the robot? Yeah, they did. But it was a PlayStation 2 controller. Isn't that crazy, too? Nice. That's kind of cool. Yeah. But what did I use it for? 
I didn't really want to go pick up the pallets of water or like the, not pallets, <laughs> but like the things of water. So my robot, people would be like, what is the robot doing all the time? And like, I swear during the deployment, it was mostly used to go pick up Matt's, Matt's water from the pallet. It's yes. just, it's just the sir. You're just, yeah, this, just be what's like, the sir I doing? just opened my door. Just, I mean, it was cool to learn how to drive it too. And it was on a PlayStation 2 remote. I saw it once <laughs> um, and it was, we called an EOD and the Air Force guys were in the area and they came out. And it was, it took so agonizingly long and they were doing like a left seat, right seat with the Marine EOD, which I came to learn. And we hung out with one this past weekend. They're, um, they're much more Rambo style EOD. And they were like watching them and they're like, all right, get the robot out. And like, it just like barely moved. And we've, we've been out there all day. We're yeah, on a, great. we're on a road. We've taken fire multiple times. I'm just trying to get these kids back. Like it's not going well. And finally the EOD tech like looks at his 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 uh, assistant team leader goes, let's go. And then, like he just walked out there with a K bar and just started stabbing the ground. <laughs> and, with his, and his other guy was sweeping. This is their technique. He just starts stabbing the ground. And he's like looking back at me. He's like, how's it looking back there? And I was like, I don't know, dude. You're scaring the shit out of me. And he's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And he like hits it. And he goes, oh, found it. Picks it up with his bare hands. Other Fucking guy picks up the other part. And I was just like, okay, that's why they get that bonus. I had no idea until that moment. <laughs> Gnarly dudes. It's called the take the risk bonus. Just go pick it up, see if it does anything. Well, and at that time, I, f- I found out, was we, we talked to him. Farmer Joe's his name. Uh, he's a friend of uh, King Picks Media. They do a lot of cool stuff. Um, he said that they were, they were pumping them through. They were pumping them through that schoolhouse in um, Niceville, Florida, I think it is. And dudes were getting anywhere between fifty to $80,000 bonus. That's I think wild. it's hosted by a Navy school, isn't it? It's it is a cool. na- he said it's a Navy mm-hmm. school, and they're the ones who like they take over that schoolhouse. But like, it's a Navy base, and there's like other parts. It's it's like a all bunch of them together. But like, they were just rocking and rolling, and you know that was also when I learned they're like, don't put on the bomb suit. It doesn't, <laughs> you know, it's only good for like x amount of pounds of explosives. And at that time in Afghanistan, they were doing like. 4x so they're like if i'm gonna get blown up i'm not getting blown up with a 300 pound suit <laughs> that won't help i'm just going out there with a knife yeah the more you know the, the more you know yeah did you see sure. the route clearance things the electric current thing did you see that uh tell me what the electric current look we had um you know i'm trying to remember what the vehicle was that they had them on but we had like excavation equipment on the, the wraps on, on some of the wraps and well i was thinking um the M88, I believe. Was that the Max Pro? Uh, no, it's um. Anyway, it doesn't. I'm trying to remember the vehicle, but anyway, we had like we had mine clearing vehicles by the time we were out there too, and the M wraps did have a few of those. What looked like uh, not they're not air raiders, but the farming equipment. Oh my God, I saw one of these. Get, not oh yeah, yes, 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 yes. I didn't see one. No, of those. that's the towing one. Uh, not, that's not the right one, but that I, thing's really impressive too. By the way, so. Uh, um, what is it? I'm trying to think. Uh, Bozzy, can you uh, type uh, route? I don't know what the right word would be. It was it was a route clearance vehicle on an MRAP, but it had an electric current that it would shoot out. Yeah, I mean, that sounds cool, but we didn't have, I it, don't even remember that. It looked like the Tesla ball from hell. It had a swing arm like that. You see that photo to the right? Um, I saw one of those launch oh, over a, okay. a wall. That was terrifying, actually. Um, Because we didn't know that they were like, route clearance was rolling by, and also- yeah. Micklicks. Oh, Why yeah, can't I remember, I remember what that is? Yeah, it's kind of <laughs> like the same, same, uh, yeah, uh, shoot it. Same, same strategy as the, uh, what were those things in, in World War II that they did to blow up the sea wire? Um, APOBs. The APOBs. I carried like, one. I saw it. It was gnarly. Well, it's like Before that, right? It's like a string of, of grenades to just blow up the mine. Mm hmm. It was a one meter clearance. It was yeah. supposed to be. Yeah, the necklaces are cool. They're cool until you see one of the grenades that's literally by a string, just <laughs> like you'd see it's every army equipment, man. Yeah, every every <laughs> time one of them would, you'd have a stray, and it would just do its own thing. Um, but no, so the the route clearance one with the electric current, it was it worked really really great. It had one weakness: if you got any amount of close at all, it would light things on fire because it <laughs> it didn't really have like an aiming mechanism to it it was just constantly like yeah. like shooting out current and the one time i saw it do this was it was like a night patrol and there we're like 
just sitting out there observing people doing like an LPOP, you know, nothing big, just being like, okay, what are they doing? And then, you know, in Afghanistan, especially where there's nothing, they're just coming through. And then all of a sudden it gets close to a building and it shoots the current on a wall and just left a, like a scorched mark. And then all these dogs came out and it lit a dog on fire and the dog literally ran out in the field. <laughs> that was, it was the craziest thing I'd ever seen in my life. And I was like, uh, all right, we'll just I had to report it up. And they're like, what do you mean a dog was lit on fire? And I'm like, Rob Clarence lit a dog on fire. I don't know what to tell you. It was, it was like a big electric ball. Like everyone's here. We're fine. But that dog, I don't know. He belongs to the Lord now. <laughs> there was so, it was such a weird innovation time. Yeah. No, I remember. So, um, we helped uh, provide security for the elections. I don't know if you guys ever had to do that. Yes. But I remember at our battalion, they brought out this new thing, and it looked like, I don't know, it was probably like this big. It looked like a satellite dish and, like, held on to it. And what it was was it it sent the right type of, of radio waves to make you feel like you were on fire. So their <laughs> idea was like, hey, this is your, like, mitigation tool in between, like, uh, for like a suicide, uh, you know, a suicide bomber, right? Like a, it's a guy with an S vest on. But like, if you work through that practically, and this is why you know, like soldiers didn't do that. It's like, you have what, a few seconds to figure out whether or not like Maybe. that guy is actually yeah. like running at you and going to blow yeah. you up. Or if that guy is running at you to get your help, right? You yeah. have a split second. You don't have enough time to roll out this giant sonar satellite thing, right? And be like, let me just, let me hit him with this really quick. Yeah. Yeah. But I did think that that was wild innovation, right? It was like- yeah. Like it, it, it only makes you feel like you're on fire and has no like actual, it doesn't cause any harm to your body, which I thought was wild too. So it's like a deterrent to make them like stop. Yeah. So it's like, you can, it's a crowd control device is what is they call this it. Is this what happened us. to the people in maybe, maybe. I know what you're Cuba? talking about. Is that what you're talking about? Theirs, I think, are probably different radio waves to kill us. You know? yeah. but <laughs> if it's the Russians and the Cubans. I mean, did you guys know that Cuba is like the central spy headquarters of the world. Like that's where they all go is Havana. How I can know. I be a spy? That sounds go awesome. Go hang out in Havana. They'll recruit you, I'm sure. That's, I mean, there are worse places to be than Cuba. It seems pretty cool. I mean, if you're I, on I the government's so dime. Too. I know, I know. Well, I mean, I don't think that like living there is probably very cool, but being an American and going to visit there and having the money that, that we bring, that would be a good time. I mean, Jay-Z had fun. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> him and, him and because <laughs> him and they went. Remember that when like- they became ambassadors. That was when we were doing our celebrity ambassador program. Oh. We sent them to Cuba, and then we sent Dennis Rodman to North Korea. <laughs> that even makes any sense to me. You're not going to send, like, a Hispanic baseball player down to Cuba who, like, has a relationship with Cuba. You're going to send Jay. Yeah. But, um, I mean, he has really good music, though. No, he does, yeah. The beehive. No, so the other um, thing about this is we had, DARPA had given us this translation tool that we talk into, and now it wasn't, it, it didn't learn your words or your language. You had to save phrases into it. But there was a little uh, button on there, and you can change it into 12 different languages. So I could speak in there and say, you know, hey, put your weapon down and then change it into whatever language I want. So I just speak into this thing and talk to the Iraqis. Um, as long as you would, that, now there's this giant book and it showed you which phrases it knows and which ones it, it wow. doesn't to stay away from. But I thought that was really cool too. Yeah. Then now we had a lot of assets because my battalion was the, the main effort of the war at the time. And so like we got everything that we wanted to. Yeah. <clears throat> and they gave us one of those tough book computers to have in my Humvee. Mm-hmm. And so anytime that we had the fast movers going going across and they were using their imagery, they could send their imagery down to my Humvee so I could like watch what the, the F-16s were doing. That's awesome. We ended up using those later for like border interdiction missions. You'll find this also funny because yeah. it's a perfect military thing. <laughs> so they fly over with the F-16. They're like, hey, that truck over there has a really weird heat signature. You infantry guys, go look at it. Go take a look. <laughs> Check it out. You know yeah. what I mean? Sure. Like, go yeah. make sure that that's not a car bomb. I'm like, we'll just get out. We'll just like open up the <laughs> trunk. You know what I mean? Be like, oh, that's a nice looking bomb you got there. Negative, Maverick. <laughs> yeah. Negative. Right. No. Um, man, what year was this? This was 2009. 2009? Yeah. Uh, I just remember jammers were a big thing that yep. we had at the time. Oh, those were really, really. Uh, the Duke I systems? They, they were It was well. just a backpack and they were. The oh one, yeah, the ones that we—that was the Duke too. It was just the man. What was it? It was I called never, the man, man, man pack. I don't pack. remember exactly. I just remember it was like one poor souls like thing to carry, and then like we very quickly were like, we're not carrying that. Like, <laughs> it was triple digits amount of weight, and and I'm sure 
whatever signals and radiation were coming off of it weren't great. Oh, I'm sure. But hey, you know, it, they're like, it might work. And they're like, it is. But in Afghanistan, they quickly changed to like pull cord and they stopped using the technology. They just went straight to those. Uh, it's Car- crazy carbon. what you start yeah, with yeah, on yeah. deployment. Yeah. That's actually what we did too. Yeah. That's what they ended up doing. It's crazy what you start with on deployment versus what you end with. Like when it comes to like shedding gear, you're oh, like, I know. fuck, I don't need that anymore. I'm not fucking carrying that this time. So we got new body armor the week before we left. And they're like, oh, thank God this came in. I'm like, great. So like, had it not come in, you would have just sent us with a shitty body armor. Like, <laughs> like, you know, it was the way they presented it to us. They're like, thank God this is going to help you guys so much. I'm like, but, but you were about to send us without all this stuff. Like, You're not looking at this the right way, sir. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dude, um, did they I have, just think that stuff is funny. I do think. Did they test that stuff out on y'all? Uh, we had the modular tactical vests, which were the MTVs. They yeah, were, the, the one, the pull string. They were literally only made for vehicles. And they, oh, it was I'm not sure. When they were introduced, the idea was that we want to stop people getting injured in vehicles, right? Because it mm-hmm. covered up your whole body. Um, it also was a fleece line. Oh, yeah. No, I didn't Which is great for the Middle East. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, you got to keep, keep the insulation in. You know, don't want a body it, temperature to lower. It was just made to be like, if you dismount for five seconds, get back in. And we trained with them the whole time. And at the last minute, they're like, you guys are getting plate carriers. And it was the best thing that could have ever happened. We wouldn't have made it. That's crazy. Because we were even like low-key, like pulling off the yokes and stuff. Because it was just all, it was like wearing a like wool coat everywhere you went while fighting, while trying to counterinsurgency. Like it was not great. Well, the the best thing that happened to us is we didn't have AC in our vehicles. um, But the, they did come out with this like cooling vest for us to wear when we went out in the Bradley. So you like, like hook it up and it'd be like AC was running through. Um, nice. That, that was kind of cool technology. Um, I think if there was other stuff too. Oh, did you guys wear the, the, um, what looks like a body cam, right? But it would, it would tell you where a round was coming from. So if somebody was shooting at you, uh, it'd be like, it is 60 degrees, 212 we had, the, meters. we had it on the truck, but it, it detected oh. uh, like where sniper fire was yeah, coming from. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. Yeah, we had, um, we were testing them, but we never got them. But it was like, you'd put it on your shoulder or something. It'd be like, turn left to avoid bullets. Like it was like weird stuff like that, but we never got that. Well, I'm surprised at the technology that you guys had cuz you know, one Me of too. for a lot of reasons, I love the Marine Corps, but one of them was they were covering our flank while we were out there and we went to go meet up with them and when I saw that they were like in old IVAs and carry around M16 like A1s and some bolt act. No, I'm just kidding about the bolt action, but it was like you have I was no like, idea oh, how I need to shut the fuck up yeah. because like I don't realize that these guys are going out there in in a uh, completely different experience than than we were too you're more accurate than you are not accurate (laughs) like some of some of the weapons were like you know tom's cold war platoon (laughs) you know the like from the chosen reservoir it was it was bad like there was only a few people that had m4s and everyone else we called them boomsticks because it was so disproportionately bigger than everything just a just an m16 that's you know, it's not really big, but in that type of environment. It did seem big. It's huge. Yeah. Especially yeah. in Afghanistan where, like, you're doing multiple clicks a day, just walking around being like, do, 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 do. Yeah. No, it was, it was, uh, it's a very different time. We had, so we had that stuff. Weapon systems, we had the, the 203, um, whatever that's called. The 320. The 320. I shot it once Were and you, it broke. The attachment? Yeah. No, no, it was like it had five or six. Rounds. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We, yeah, the six pack. It, it, was, it like, was a 203 gun. Yeah. It just yeah, shot yeah, 203s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was saying. Yeah. <laughs> it's the 320. Oh, yeah. It's the 320. Yeah. Mine broke. Like after I shot it once, like I was like, eh, I don't want to mess around with this explosives anymore. It couldn't handle like the recoil. Because it was all composite. If yes. I remember right. It was all plastic yeah. and it was scary and it was way too heavy and like it was impractical. And they're, I'm like, we're not carrying this on foot patrols. This isn't going to work. And that was like a big turning point because all the stuff that they had like put towards Iraq and like this works here, Iraq, Iraq, Iraq. We get in Afghanistan where they're doing like airdrops of water and stuff like that. Yeah. They're like, it's just not going to work here. Like, we sense. did have a few Humvees in 08 in Garmser, but they very quickly overheated. They couldn't handle the terrain, some of them. Yeah. And then that was it. They're like, all right, get MRAPs. And they just left all the Humvees there. And I think they're being used now, actually, probably. Yeah, we had, uh, they did introduce MRAPs probably six months in. And so uh, we had a mixture of of MRAPs and Humvees. 
We were originally a, a combination of Humvees and Bradleys, uh, but we were like destroying the city and, and not like blowing it up kind of way. It was like they would repave the road <laughs> and then we'd take the Bradley out on it and fuck the whole thing up and like, yeah. then they'd have to repave the road. You know what I mean? It was like little things like that or we'd be ripping down power lines or running over curbs. That'll do it. So they were like no more tracked vehicles. Who paved the roads? America? It was the Iraq. I mean, it was probably American money. Okay. But I mean, it was... It was Iraqi contractors. I heard a common tactic then, I just remember being briefed on it, was that they would go out and they'd take tires and they would light tires on fire on the asphalt to like melt the asphalt. <laughs> and then it was, you know, it's a stage process. One guy goes out, lights a tire on fire, tire burns really bright and yeah. hot, melts it down, just like move it to the side like it's like goo almost, oh. and then put the ID under it and then it looks paved. So I did also hear you can pour just everyday gasoline on asphalt and it'll become gooey. And so you, I think that's part one of the tactics that they use to yeah. move it out of the way so that they could dig stuff. You brought up, and at some point we're gonna we're gonna get to vote for America. We but, will. We got plenty uh, of time. But I, I, you, you may, you reminded me of something funny. So right, we enter into Operation New Dawn. You know, we're gonna be out there winning the hearts and the minds. They send a bunch of infantry guys out there to like decide what civil affairs projects we're gonna do. I can tell you that that was part of the problem, right? Is you're like, hey, send this guy and let him sign off on all these projects. And I'm, I promise you, I did the best that I could. But that doesn't mean that like I have any idea what's going on in the city of Missoula or like how it actually all works together. And you know, maybe there should be some government bureaucrat uh, who's doing it instead. But I'll tell you, we reintroduced uh, dumpsters. Uh, like they weren't like full size that that you'd see in America, but we were able to get like a dozen regular size dumpsters and then a few dozen of the like trash cans. Mm -hmm. uh, they they look different, but similar to the ones that we have here in America. And I only bring it up because, you know, they have those big plastic wheels on them. Yes. So I come back like a week later and I don't see any of the plastic trash cans anywhere. I'm like, what did you guys do with my trash cans? <laughs> right? This is supposed to be so that you're not putting all of your trash in the street. out in the street. Uh, which I, now that I look back, like it, I guess it didn't matter because it was mostly outdoor plumbing. Speaking of like how much better America is. I mean, that was Iraq's second largest city and most homes didn't have indoor plumbing. So it was like, uh, what I found out is that they had taken all of the wheels off uh, I don't know what they did with the the actual dumpsters, but they were they were lighting them on fire because you know it's like really thick plastic. Okay. And so if you light those things on fire, they'll stay lit forever. And so they're cooking their food like with the toxic you know uh, smoke coming off of burning the the wheels. So I've seen them burn wheels too and burn tires. Huh. Um, All I'm thinking right now is in 2009 the same technology was introduced that we introduced in New York City in 2024 <laughs> yeah. because the mayor of New York City did Didn't a like demonstration where he showed a trash can. Did you see I that? Thought, yeah, I thought that, that was pretty funny too. <laughs> I was like this. I almost said like, I brought that to Iraq. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you should have been there been like, guys, this has been, a, this is, a, and they're like, freedom, freedom. And he just drops it and he's like, we're cleaning up New York. Yeah. I just remember being in New York in like 2014 or 15, I can't remember and just being overtaken by like, I was like, why is there trash on the street? And like one of the most popular cities in the world. And it's because they didn't have the technology that was available to the Iraqis and the rest of the world <laughs> yeah, until 2024. Not, I, I don't know. Well, in innovation comes in many different forms, I guess. Yeah, it does. Um, but you just have those the, those crazy experiences when you're there. And they're, you know, they're not all kinetic. They're, it's a lot of just funny stuff that happens too. But it gives you a grounding that I think is so desperately needed on a global scale by everyone. Um, I don't want anyone to go to war. War is humanity's failure, if, if I yeah. can think of a way to describe it. I mean, because if it's the best way we can do, decide who wins is by killing each other, then we, we failed. But it does give you like a real, a real appreciation for what you have and understanding the way the rest of the world lives. Yeah. Um, when you see those things in various different forms, like, you know, there's countries that have like rolling, they call them brownouts. They're like, yeah. like it's not blackouts. It's just sometimes you won't have power. You don't know when it'll happen. Oh, well, and things like that. But like, I've, I've, I kind of wish we had a system where like you could like, after after high school, do a thing, like you go on like a tour or something like, uh, I don't want to say like mandatory military service, but some form of, I hate to say government service, but like oh, non 
some selfless nonprofit something you go do like mission trips. I love that. Whatever. I've, so for like know, two years. Yeah, they've floated these ideas before about having mandatory service like they do in Israel. I've always been a big supporter of of this type of program. But I don't think that it has to be all foreign. I don't think it has to be all military. In fact, yeah. most people, I mean, we know this, most of the people, even some of the people that join and serve with us, like, shouldn't be there, right? Yes. And I think, uh, why can't you, one of the big failures that I thought and and I think that I've highlighted it in different ways since we started talking, is you can't send the military to go do civil affairs and other operations like that, State Department type stuff. So like if you had the military, you had a, a program for people to go help in the State Department, whether it's just, you know, helping out the communities or helping build wells or whatever you're doing. And then don't we need that here? Yes. Right. Like nobody's signing up to go help homeless people. I mean, there's a few volunteer organizations, but do you know what you hear from them is that the turnover is so high. Like people will go and they'll volunteer to help the homeless for one or two times and then they're done. Right. And so you have uh, a lot of opportunity for, I think, young people to give back, but also maybe an opportunity to kind of teach them a little bit more about life, but maybe even put them on the right path to a career. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're missing, like you're maybe, missing perspective. Yeah, uh, and just like I've said, like if you know they just did like a mission trip or something, like I, I don't know what the exact term is, but some form of like self selfless service, like to the service of others. I mean, that's where I've always found the best version of myself. Yeah, like if you had to work for like a instead of going straight to college, you get like two years where we give you a stipend or something, something to live on, what and they, you can go to Doctors Without Borders or you could go help clean up. Do clean water missions somewhere? I, I don't. I don't know. Like so what, what do you think about do? this? What if? I mean, could we just open up the the GI Bill? Could could we expand the GI Bill to other parts of the government for service? Mm. Right, like that was. Uh, you know, the pay wasn't great for us. But afterwards, not for us. Knowing, it wasn't good for you, officer. Well, <laughs> I don't think you really start making like. Anyway, you're right. You're right. I I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, 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 you're right. No, I shouldn't. Um, but it's uh, my point is just that 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 educate that those benefits, your education and your your housing benefits are 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 hugely helpful when you get out and in real life. And it changed I think my life. Maybe just expanding those programs, and that's the reward if you go into into service. Um, you know, for your country for two years. I mean, I've, I've always loved the idea. And to be honest with you, um, I was, a, I was an ROTC instructor when I was a, a cadet too, right? So like when you're a senior, you are in charge of the, the freshmen and sophomore and juniors, right? And, okay. and I only bring that up because I think that there are some young people who could use two years of going out there and volunteering and doing some, some manual labor and carrying some sandbags or some mm -hmm. humanitarian aid bags or whatever it is, build a, build, build a, build a well. Uh, I, I think that those are, those are pretty cool skills to learn too. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not like, you know, manual labor, but learning civil engineering and, uh, you know, also just what, what the problems are going on in other countries. I mean, team Rubicon does a really good thing, yeah. uh, with their disaster relief programs. Like if people just like join team Rubicon for two years or just, I, I, yeah. I don't know. I think, Cause you're missing so much and it's, it's hard. I, I, I think it's hard to criticize our country when you've never left it or oh, I agree. like in general, like that's just it. I mean, maybe I guess if you go to different parts of the country, you can gain a greater appreciation for the things you have, but like something that will like rock you to your core is going to a, a just a foreign land and being like, okay, never mind. I'm, I'm good. I understand things now. It's a little different here. Like, I want to go back. <laughs> like, I've seen this, uh, and, and I don't know that I'll do it any justice, but I'll try to summarize it. Uh, it's a funny clip. It's of like a American, um, you know, kind of progressive seeming protester mm -hmm. uh, talking to a diplomat from, I don't know, I think it was like China or something like that, right? And they were like, um, it wasn't China, but... Um, and anyway, so so the young person is like, well, I bet that, um, you know, your leaders, 
uh, would would never have you vote on this. And and the guy looks and he's like, vote? What are you talking about? Right? And so I, it just highlights that, like, wow. people people think that they have rights. And we were talking about the UK even yeah. not even having any constitutional rights um, that were, you know, that that uh, are supersede the government. Mm -hmm. But we do, right? And that's, like, uh, just a unique and powerful and incredible thing. People also kind of forget that America started democracy. Right now you, I mean, I, I'm sorry, implemented it or has seen the most success from a constitution, right? You had the French Revolution, but the American Revolution is really where democracy and freedom started to grow throughout the world. And so I think that I would wish that we had less America bashers in our media uh, and, and they saw the same things that we did that in fact, America is not perfect, but it's better than the rest. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't agree more. I, I think it's almost like people feel guilt. And so they don't want to, to yeah, say that. that it's, it's great. And it's not perfect. That's not what I'll ever say. No, no, Nothing is perfect. America definitely isn't, but you can also be proud of the things that you have and the things that your country's doing. Cause again, I don't,